the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. A social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Were the Beatles Anarchists? by Marcus Collins I'm not an anarchist. So stated John Lennon of the Beatles in 1966. And that might have been that, if we're not considering a mercurial figure like Lennon, discussing a disputed concept like anarchism during a transformative period like the 1960s. Lennon, anarchists, and the intellectual world they inhabited were engaged in an experimentation in 1960s Britain. Experimentation produced uncertainty and radical ambiguity. And it's this ambiguous and ambivalent relationship between anarchists and the Beatles that I'll look at in this anarchist essay. I'll start by examining how the Beatles engaged with anarchism in the 1960s. I'll then turn the tables by assessing what anarchists of various stripes thought about the Beatles during two phases of the band's career. During Beatlemania from 1963 to 1965, and then during the heady days of the counterculture in the late 60s and early 70s. So let's start with the Beatles' ideology. When Lennon declared I'm not an anarchist, was he actually right? It's not difficult to find alternative quotations which appear to show the opposite. For example, he proposed that we don't need centralised government in 1969. On the other hand, he also made statements that can and have been used as conclusive evidence that he was a capitalist, a communist, a liberal, a libertarian, a socialist, an environmentalist, a pacifist, an advocate of violence and, if used in combination, a total hypocrite. Lennon notoriously found himself unable to decide whether to count himself in or out of revolution, in two versions of the song of that name released in 1968. The following year he expressed a preference for evolution over revolution, only to reverse himself again when the Beatles officially broke up in 1970. The man who had so memorably mocked those carrying pictures of Chairman Mao in 1968 proudly supported a Chairman Mao badge in the early 70s, on the grounds that Mao was doing a good job. In 1971, Lenin issued his most famous political manifesto in the song Imagine. Its atheism and collectivism tallied with his communist leanings at the time, but its internationalism bore little resemblance to Maoism, while its pacifism was at odds with the Trotskyism of close political allies of Lenin's, such as Tariq Ali. British Marxists were quick to identify Imagine as being anarchist or utopian socialist in sentiment, and as such, hopelessly naive. If we turn from Lenin's words to his actions, some certainly appear anarchic in effect, if not necessarily formulated as such. The Beatles' self-owned group of Apple businesses were at least in theory non-state, not-for-profit organisations which placed the collective good above individual self-interest. The band's most elaborate utopian scheme was to establish a self-contained community on a Greek island in 1967. Though their main concern was to escape the drug laws, this was just part of a broader libertarian ambition. According to the Beatle, Paul McCartney, the idea was to do what you want in a sort of hippie commune where nobody would interfere with your lifestyle. And when that came to nothing, Lennon donated a Chilia island in the Irish Sea to communards involved in the Digger Action Movement. An interest in civil disobedience came to the fore in 1969, when Lennon returned his MBE and promoted 
the bed-ins he was staging with Yoko Ono as being a latter-day version of the picket or protest march. The same year, McCartney's original vision for what became the rooftop concert was to occupy the Palace of Westminster. When the concert was relocated to the roof of the Apple headquarters in London's Savile Row, the Beatles still hoped to highlight the oppressive nature of state power by courting arrest for breaching the peace with instruments in hand. But once again, it's important to consider these actions as part of a process of trial and error in which Lennon and his bandmates weighed up virtually every sort of political strategy. An interest in alternative institutions and civil disobedience competed for attention with efforts at consciousness raising, lobbying, patronage, fundraising, voting, even standing for Parliament, as when George Harrison tried to persuade Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr to be candidates for the Natural Law Party um, in 1992. The accent was an error when it came to the establishment of alternative communities. Apple Corps was dysfunctional, the Apple Boutique was quickly liquidated, and their plans for a free park and an experimental school were literally utopian ventures, established nowhere. More successful were the ideal communities created in the Beatles' songs and performances. Yellow Submarine depicted a fraternity in which all needs were satisfied with the minimum of effort. Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and Magical Mystery Tour invited listeners to participate in an imagined act of togetherness. In the 1967 Our World broadcast, the Beatles connected the countercultural community, singing the chorus of All You Need Is Love, with the worldwide community watching the proceedings via a live satellite hookup. And for their televised performance of Hey Jude in 1968, audience participation increased as the song went on, until the Beatles became submerged in a joyous crowd. Observing such activities was a small but vocal collection of anarchists active in 1960s Britain. In the early 60s, it was not the Beatles so much as their fans who caught the attention of anarchist intellectuals. Beatlemania was examined as part of a wider critique of popular culture developed by Charles Radcliffe in his journal Heatwave. The ideal society described in the first issue of Heatwave was standard anarchistic fare, a collectivised, decentralised, demilitarised federation of autonomous communities. Radcliffe dismissed the insurrectionary potential of the proletariat who were indistinguishable from the bourgeoisie in their consumerism and inertia. The new, true revolutionaries were, in Radcliffe's view, an assortment of countercultures he termed the provotariat. New methods of revolution were to be found not in strikes, party building, or disparate and fragmentary protests, but in the provocation of the ruling elite through youth culture and especially popular music. In November 1963, Radcliffe published an article entitled Pop Goes the Beatle. He found much to criticise in both the band and their devotees. He argued that the Beatles' tunes lacked melody and harmony, and their marketing was based on deception and manipulation of young people. Beatlemania, according to Radcliffe, was a media-induced teenage orgasm substitute, and the Beatlemaniacs themselves were not challenging anything. Even so, the Beatles were still an improvement on what Radcliffe described elsewhere as the sickly gutlessness of orthodox pop. Merseybeat had begun as a form of self-expression, and the music, however crude, was new and young and vigorous. The Beatles and their contemporaries were more independent of the music industry, and so were the fans who were increasingly able to select stars of their own choosing and who constituted a provocation to the adults in power. If anarchism has nothing to say to these fans, Radcliffe concluded, it has nothing to say at all. 
A more full-throated anarchist defence of the Beatles appeared in Peace News in December 1963. It was written by Richard Maybe, sometime member of the Oxford Anarchist Group and future editor and writer. Maybe argued that the Beatles forced a wholesale reassessment of the music industry. Their music and demeanour were refreshing and their stardom gave the lie to the idea that, as he put it, all financial success, hit parades, latest sales gimmicks, heroes, agents, managers and promoters were all a priori, wicked, reactionary and corrupting. The Beatles' pursuit of music as a way of life was, according to Maybe, mirrored by their fans. They were able to escape from the drab world of adult responsibility and obscure political squabblings and experience unbridled joy in a blatantly subversive fashion. Most provocative was Maybe's suggestion that Beatlemania showed how orthodox models of revolution had things backwards. As he saw it, instead of eliminating the baddies, royalty, employers, etc. first, and expecting the end of boredom, drabness and monotony to follow, Beatlemania provided a revolutionary alternative to this world in advance of structural transformation. Yet, for all Maybe's optimism, scepticism was more common in anarchist publications in the early and mid-1960s when it came to the subject of youth culture. Maybe's enthusiasm and Radcliffe's ambivalence towards Beatlemania found little sympathy among older anarchist intellectuals. The sexologist Alex Comfort likened the effect of the Beatles working up a teenage audience to that of Adolf Hitler, or the smoking of a marijuana cigarette. The educationalist A.S. Neal viewed the Beatles' popularity as a symptom of defective schooling. Pupils engaged in making and doing would, in his view, not think of listening to their records. And Beatlemania could be prevented, according to Neil, if schools dealt with emotional things. Another radical educationalist, Albert Hunt, ridiculed Maybe for parroting publicity handouts. What, he asked, did wetting your seat and putting your fingers in your mouth at a Beatles concert do for the cause of revolution? The counterculture forced anarchists to reassess the Beatles in the late 1960s. The counterculture resembled anarchism in what Julie Stevens has termed its anti-disciplinary politics. Although some anarchists were deeply dubious towards the counterculture, the likes of Albert Hunt and Alex Comfort were as sympathetic to hippies as they had been hostile to Beatle maniacs. Hunt maintained that the Beatles' quest for freedom constituted a revolutionary demand in a society which expected everyone to perform their allotted role. Alex Comfort likewise thought that the underground could be the most important feature of our time, if it foreshadowed a coming generation which, as he put it, will no longer take orders, no longer respond to the conventional economic incentives, no longer value technology or discovery for their own unrelated selves. Charles Radcliffe, however, was if anything less enthused by the hippie Beatles than their previous incarnation as mop tops. He condemned their risible, if quintessentially English, ambition to become shopkeepers. Radcliffe also mocked their foppishly absurd attire, and he slated Sergeant Pepper for its grandiose superficiality. The Situationist Manifesto, he co-authored in 1967, replicated the Situationist International's critique of culture as a spectacle designed to distract the populace from the reality of their own oppression and alienation. British Situationists were unimpressed by the Beatles' artistic experimentation. Theoretically, Situationists were anti-art. Actually, they were in a direct line of descent from Dada, Surrealism and other early 20th century modernists in their determination to remake culture into a subversive force. The Beatles were drawing upon many of the same artistic currents and knew some of the same artists and performers. 
Yet the Beatles became a byword for conformity in British situationist publications. And the Beatles' artistic ventures were portrayed as turning avant-garde art into yet another commodity ripe for exploitation. The British Situationist Manifesto charged Yoko Ono's performance art as representing a spectacle of revolt designed to titillate and distract. In the late 1960s and early 70s, the first books about British popular culture began to be published. And remarkably, most of them were authored by anarchists. George Melly, Richard Maybe, Jeff Nuttall and Mick Farron all saw popular music as a potentially subversive force. Melly argued that Pop's commitment to total freedom made its politics almost totally anarchist. Maybe saw 50s teenagers as erecting the scaffolding of an alternative society. Nuttall envisaged the counterculture as the beginnings of the erosion of the square society, and Farron saw post-war youth culture as a revolution in its purest form. However, Farron, Melly, Maybe and Nuttall diverged when it came to the Beatles' contribution to youth culture, and as such their arguments corresponded to diverse strands of anarchist thought. Mick Farron hero-worshipped Lennon, but nonetheless considered the Beatles part of a compromise of a revolution. They were too mainstream and insufficiently confrontational for his tastes. The Beatles had been trying to turn people on gently, Farron remarked in 1968, whereas his band, the Deviants, were pursuing a harder line. George Melly thought the Beatles no different from other pop acts in lacking the social critique which would have allowed them to develop their anti-authoritarian instincts into something greater than libertarianism. Melly believed that Lennon's song Revolution deserved credit for exposing how pop acts out revolt rather than um, delivers upon it. Richard Maybe and Jeff Nuttall shared Melly's concern that commodification had turned revolt into style, but they were even more condemnatory of the Beatles' hippie phase. In his book The Pop Process, Maybe accused them of abandoning the toughness and common sense of their earlier music. To have surrendered meekly to the Maharishi was as much of a political folly as a religious one, Maybe argued, since their stay at the Maharishi's ashram removed them from the realities of poverty in India. The charge of escapism also appeared in Nuttall's book Bomb Culture. This depicted the Beatles as absorbed in their navels. Their pursuit of inner spaces, whether through drugs or religion, had, according to Nuttall, diverted them and other countercultural artists from political and social involvement. These books by Farron, Melly, Maybe and Nuttall are a good place to conclude this talk, for they draw out some general points about the relationship between anarchism and the Beatles. First, that the Beatles were a subject of much interest and some concern to anarchists in 60s Britain. Second, that there was no single anarchist perspective. A diversity of opinions is only to be expected amongst anarchists, but the divergences testified to major divisions within anarchist thought, over the revolutionary potential of different classes and generations, the speed and trajectory of social change, the function of art and the use of violence. Third, anarchist ambivalence over the Beatles was exacerbated by the band's own ambivalence towards anarchism. They were curious, but uncommitted and fickle, their political affiliations as malleable as their fashions and musical styles. In the end, the marriage between anarchism and the Beatles was just another unrealised 60s fancy. It accomplished little tangible political social change, but it left behind as its legacy some fascinating ideas and a few great songs.
Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.